Preface to Science and Hypothesis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Eastman. Science and Hypothesis by Henri Poincare. Author's Preface. To the superficial observer, scientific truth is unassailable. The logic of science is infallible. And if scientific men sometimes make mistakes, it is because they have not understood the rules of the game. Mathematical truths are derived from a few self-evident propositions, by a chain of flawless reasonings. They are imposed not only on us, but on nature itself. By them the Creator is fettered, as it were and his choice is limited to a relatively small number of solutions. A few experiments, therefore, will be sufficient to enable us to determine what choice he has made. From each experiment a number of consequences will follow by a series of mathematical deductions, and in this way each of them will reveal to us a corner of the universe. This, to the minds of most people, and to students who are getting their first ideas of physics, is the origin of certainty in science. This is what they take to be the role of experiment and mathematics. And thus, too, it was understood a hundred years ago by many men of science who dreamed of constructing the world with the aid of the smallest possible amount of material borrowed from experiment. But. Upon more mature reflection, the position held by hypothesis was seen. It was recognized that it is as necessary to the experimenter as it is to the mathematician. And then the doubt arose if all these constructions are built on solid foundations. The conclusion was drawn that a breath would bring them to the ground. This skeptical attitude does not escape the charge of superficiality. To doubt everything, or to believe everything, are two equally convenient solutions. Both dispense with the necessity of reflection. Instead of a summary condemnation, we should examine with the utmost care the role of hypothesis. We shall then recognize not only that it is necessary, but that in most cases it is legitimate. We shall also see that there are several kinds of hypotheses, that some are verifiable, and when once confirmed by experiment, become truths of great fertility, that others may be useful to us in fixing our ideas, and finally that others are hypotheses only in appearance, and reduced to definitions or to conventions in disguise. The latter are to be met with especially in mathematics and in the sciences to which it is applied. From them, indeed, the sciences derive their rigor. Such conventions are the result of the unrestricted activity of the mind, which in this domain recognizes no obstacle. For here the mind may affirm because it lays down its own laws. But let us clearly understand that while these laws are imposed on our science, which otherwise could not exist, they are not imposed on nature. Are they then arbitrary? No, for if they were, they would not be fertile. Experience leaves us our freedom of choice, but it guides us by helping us to discern the most convenient path to follow. Our laws are therefore like those of an absolute monarch, who is wise and consults his council of state. Some people have been struck by this characteristic of free convention which may be recognized in certain fundamental principles of the sciences. Some have set no limits to their generalizations, and at the same time they have forgotten that there is a difference between liberty and the purely arbitrary, so that they are compelled to end in what is called nominalism. They have asked if the savant is not the dupe of his own definitions, and if the world he thinks he has discovered is not simply the creation of his own caprice. Under these conditions science would retain its certainty,
but would not attain its object and would become powerless. Now we daily see what science is doing for us. This could not be unless it taught us something about reality. The aim of science is not things themselves as the dogmatists in their simplicity imagine, but the relations between things. Outside those relations there is no reality knowable. Such is the conclusion to which we are led. But to reach that conclusion we must pass in review the series of sciences, from arithmetic and geometry to mechanics and experimental physics. What is the nature of mathematical reasoning? Is it really deductive, as is commonly supposed? Careful analysis shows us that it is nothing of the kind, that it participates to some extent in the nature of inductive reasoning, and for that reason it is fruitful. But none the less does it retain its character of absolute rigor, and this is what must first be shown. When we know more of this instrument, which is placed in the hands of the investigator by mathematics, we have then to analyze another fundamental idea, that of mathematical magnitude. Do we find it in nature, or have we ourselves introduced it? And if the latter be the case, are we not running a risk of coming to incorrect conclusions all round? Comparing the rough data of our senses with that extremely complex and subtle conception which mathematicians call magnitude, we are compelled to recognize a divergence. The framework into which we wish to make everything fit is one of our own construction. But we did not construct it at random. We constructed it by measurement, so to speak. And that is why we can fit the facts into it without altering their essential qualities. Space is another framework which we impose on the world. Whence are the first principles of geometry derived? Are they imposed on us by logic? Lobachevsky, by inventing non-Euclidean geometries, has shown that this is not the case. Is space revealed to us by our senses? No, for the space revealed to us by our senses is absolutely different from the space of geometry. Is geometry derived from experience? Careful discussion will give the answer. No. We therefore conclude that the principles of geometry are only conventions. But these conventions are not arbitrary, and if transported into another world, which I shall call the non-Euclidean world, and which I shall endeavor to describe, we shall find ourselves compelled to adopt more of them. In mechanics we shall be led to analogous conclusions, and we shall see that the principles of this science, although more directly based on experience, still share the conventional character of the geometrical postulates. So far, nominalism triumphs. But we now come to the physical sciences, properly so called, and here the scene changes. We meet with hypotheses of another kind, and we fully grasp how fruitful they are. No doubt at the outset theories seem unsound, and the history of science shows us how ephemeral they are. But they do not entirely perish, and of each of them some traces still remain. It is these traces which we must try to discover, because in them, and in them alone, is the true reality. The method of the physical sciences is based upon the induction which leads us to expect the recurrence of a phenomenon when the circumstances which give rise to it are repeated. If all the circumstances could be simultaneously reproduced, this principle could be fearlessly applied. But this never happens. Some of the circumstances will always be missing. Are we absolutely certain that they are unimportant? Evidently not. It may be probable, but it cannot be rigorously certain. Hence the importance of the role that is played in the physical sciences by the law of probability. 
The calculus of probabilities is therefore not merely a recreation or a guide to the Baccarat player, and we must thoroughly examine the principles on which it is based. In this connection I have but very incomplete results to lay before the reader, for the vague instinct which enables us to determine probability almost defies analysis. After a study of the conditions under which the work of the physicist is carried on, I have thought it best to show him at work. For this purpose I have taken instances from the history of optics and of electricity. We shall thus see how the ideas of Fresnel and Maxwell took their rise, and what unconscious hypotheses were made by Ampere and the other founders of electrodynamics. End of Author's Preface